The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa White, CML's Membership Services Manager, and it is a pleasure to have you participate in today's webinar, where we're going to be providing a legislative update. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, those of you that are elected officials who have registered, you will receive your elected official university training credit for today's webinar, so we appreciate you participating. We are also recording the webinar and will post the recording uh, first thing tomorrow morning to cml.org on our training materials. That way, if you want to re-listen to something or perhaps um, share the, the webinar with a colleague, you'll be able to just share that link uh, directly with them. If you're not familiar with the webinar format, you'll see a control panel to the top right of the screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of the panel, which will minimize the entire box. We are muting all of you for the webinar, but feel free to ask questions by typing them into the question box on the control panel. We'll probably answer questions at the end of the webinar, so feel free to just wait, and then when we call for those questions, type them into the question box. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Vommer, CNL's Deputy Director. Again, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm going to be driving today and using CML's website as, uh, as our jumping off point. Uh, and we thought we'd start on the home page for those who uh, maybe have not gone to our legislative page and accessed some of the materials that are on there. Uh, and uh, so I'll show you a little bit about that. If you've not ever done it before, if you go to the legislative uh, session page and that opens up, there are a number of items on here. Uh, first of all, our legislative priorities uh, brochure, which is linked on our website, uh, is there, as well as uh, on the right where I'm going to be working off of our list of bills followed support and opposed bills. There we go. There it loads up. All right. So, uh, first of all, if you've not, um, if you've not, or if this is your first time here, uh, our legislative priorities is established uh, at the beginning of the session. You click this link, that'll open up um, that that list. It's uh, fairly extensive on the key issues that we're tracking. Also, our annual CML state, our weekly CML state house report, uh, online publication that is uh, sent out by email. We do that every Friday. Uh, and we cover bills that are uh, relevant that week and, and uh, ongoing through the session. New element that we added this year, uh, check out that ugly mug, is our video element of our statehouse report. Once it, it's, it's linked in the email, and then we post uh, the most current version on the website as well. You can also, on the right-hand side of the screen, look back at past issues of the statehouse report. That opens up in a PDF format. Uh, and we'll cover the bills and issues from the past and the, and the current issue uh, links as well. We're going to be working off of uh, the list on the right-hand side bar here. We post a list uh, of our support and oppose bills. We call it our box score. And then all of the bills that we follow uh, are either in the House of Representatives list or the Senate list. And then we also have a list if you want to see what's going on a particular day, and I'll open this. Um, the CML followed bills on the legislative calendar. I will try to open this. There it goes. The uh, CML bills on the legislative calendar, it will open up a list that shows you all of the bills, uh, what, uh, where they're going to be heard, what time, and then uh, by date. So there's a whole bunch of things going on uh, today. Uh, it usually goes out as far as three weeks. Um, Right now, it's uh, only going out a week, so uh, just means that there isn't much scheduled in. So that's a personal calendar uh, if you want to see what we're working on from day to day. We're going to be working off of the list of CML bills followed. And the way we're going to do this is just uh, uh, go down uh, the list. Uh, you'll see the position indicated in the uh, under the position column. Uh, there are some bills that, uh, that we'll talk about in which we're neutral. Uh, if those of you who participated in the legislative workshop last week, you may recognize some of that discussion. We'll just uh, stop off a couple points along the way and, uh, and, and then uh, have the lobbyists that's assigned to the bill talk about 
uh, the particular issues related to that bill where it's at. Um, if there are any bills that you see or are interested in that um, we don't cover, then uh, feel free to ask a question in the question box. We'll try to catch those at the end. We just want to make sure we don't run out of time. So I'm going to start off since uh, House Bill 10 on 1 is a bill that uh, I am following and just mention that this bill has been introduced, uh, Family Medical Leave Insurance Program Bill uh, here at House Bill 1001 has been introduced for the past couple of years. It will not pass the Senate again this year, but it's one to pay attention to. It creates a uh, it creates paid leave for uh, for employees that are uh, on FMLA leave, uh, and it does so by an a employee payroll deduction. Uh, and the issue we'll have with that if it comes back next year is we want to make sure if a program like that's going to be in place that administrative costs are covered. But there's not much um, uh, going on in terms of amendments with the bill this year. Uh, as all the sponsors are aware, it'll pass the House and, and will not pass the Senate. So that's House Bill uh, 1001. Um, moving on to House Bill 1003, that will be one that Megan talks about. Thank you. Uh, so House Bill 1003 has to do is one of a couple of opioid-related bills that I'll be talking about today. What this bill does is continue the opioid interim committee for five years. It also establishes continuing edu education for medical professionals, and probably most important for us, expands funding for training on substance abuse treatment and behavioral health. And that's why we support this, obviously, opioid addiction and thusly uh, opiate in some cases following is a huge issue for municipalities um, on several scales. And so we are following a lot of these opioid bills. And as you can see, the bill passed uh, finance on January 31st sitting in the Appropriations Committee, but not currently scheduled, which is why it says not on the calendar, and usually bills and appropriations sit there for a little while uh, before they get heard. What's that? Oh, I was talking about the wrong bill. That was uh, Morgan's bill. Well, go ahead, Morgan. House Bill 10. Sorry, Megan. You're good. Uh, House Bill 10. House Bill 1008 uh, is uh, the Muscle-Free Colorado Act, uh, and the bill um, uh, was put forward to fully fund uh, Colorado's uh, invasive species um, uh, program uh, run through the Colorado uh, Division of Parks and Wildlife. Um, the, the money or the funding for the program has uh, traditionally gone th uh, been funded through severance tax and just due to the volatility and uncertainty uh, that seems to be a perennial issue surrounding severance tax in recent years. It's been very difficult uh, to make sure that the program is going to be funded year after year. This uh, program in, uh, funds the boat inspection program, um, so municipal reservoirs uh, and waterways um, that uh, receive recreational boaters. This this funds that inspection program to make sure that uh, um, uh, that boaters don't transport um, and uh, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, and uh, put uh, agua mussels in, uh, and uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, into their uh, reservoirs uh, that would cause an infest, you know, that could cause a possible infestation. Um, so it kind of, you know, there, it, there's two different difficult decisions without the program that uh, municipalities would have to make. Either they close their reservoirs to recreational boaters or, or they risk an infestation that could cause millions of dollars in municipal uh, water infrastructure. Moving on next is House Bill 1020, which is Megan's. Yes, thank you. Uh, so House Bill 1020 is a follow-up from House Bill 171313, which had to do with asset forfeiture reform. Uh, what the bill did last year was uh, make it so that municipalities uh, or municipalities that uh, take part in task force could not utilize the state, uh, excuse me, the federal process, civil asset forfeiture process, unless uh, assets seized would be up to 50 or over $50,000. Um, we did oppose that bill, and when the governor did sign 1313, he put together a task force in HB 1020 is the Civil Asset Task Force recommendations. We are supportive of this legislation. Uh, CML served along with the chiefs of police uh, and other public safety officials on this piece of legislation. Uh, while there is some language in the bill that uh, says municipalities need to report certain uh, forfeitures if they're done over, under public ordinance, nuisance ordinance, we think that that'll be a pretty narrow application and the grant funding in the bill is definitely worth supporting as it will help get our law enforcement agencies whole. 
Okay, Diane has the next two. First is House Bill 1022. 1022 is the bill that comes out of the interim sales task, task force and creates a request for information uh, process through the Department of Revenue for uh, tax administration for self-collecting <clears throat> um, home rules. And uh, CML supports the bill because it includes all the backstops uh, recognizing our constitutional authority and the requirement that any um, new technology keep us whole on the revenue side. It's passed both chambers and is on its way to be signed by the governor. And then next is House Bill 1031. 1031 likewise has passed both um, <clears throat> the House and the Senate and came out of the um, Pension uh, Reform Commission, the interim committee. This bill uh, just simply makes it easier for public employers to uh, affiliate with the FPPA. Sticking with Diane, House Bill 1056. 1056, likewise, came out of the Pension Reform Commission. It um, does two things. It makes it possible in statute for the FPPA to allow um, certain enrollment forms for health history to be uh, made electronic, so it brings us into the 21st century. Um, the second thing that it did was it uh, did a fix that was um, <clears throat> um, that was requested by the F FPPA of some uh, kind of unique statutory provisions saying that if you had um, mischaracterized or fails, failed to report a previous um, uh, existing health condition, that that not be used as a disqualifying factor um, for um, your uh, pension benefits, whereas if you'd reported it, it would be potentially be excluded. Um, that's working its way through the Senate. It was kind of um, that fix was changed in the House. We'll see where it goes with the Senate, but the most important piece is getting that um, update to the 21st century electric, electric, <laughs> electronic health history form fix. Um, so that's likely to go through the Senate. And before we move on to Megan, just to note how we display things on this sheet, if you're looking at it, you'll note that when we, uh, when a bill dies, it's referred to as postponed indefinitely. You'll see it on the right-hand sidebar in the automatic update that the um, that comes through the, the legislature system. We also try to call it out separately so it's easy to see. So, for example, House Bill 1062, postponed indefinitely, that one's gone for good. Uh, Megan has the next one, which is House Bill 1067, which unfortunately has not yet gone for good. That's correct. So the Right to Rest Act uh, that's been introduced this year is very similar to versions we've seen in the past. This is the bill that establishes um, a, quote, bill of rights, if you will, for persons experiencing homelessness and prohibits any municipality, not just municipalities, counties and the state, but it's primarily a municipal issue, um, from enacting or enforcing any ordinances that might conflict with those rights. Uh, we did expect that that bill was going to be heard in the local government committee uh, this afternoon, actually. That has been pushed off. Uh, There's some word that the sponsors are looking at potential amendments, although CML staff has yet to see any of those. And down at the bottom, continuing with Megan, is House Bill 1076. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, House Bill 1076 has to do with uh, looking at decertification of peace officers if they are untruthful or misleading. Uh, if they make an untruthful statement or omit a, t a material fact. I took this to our policy committee last Friday uh, with a recommendation of uh, s staff discretion to support. Um, but feedback I did receive from the policy committee is if we were going to support legislation like this, it was important that the, uh, that the, how do I put this, that the, that the standard for actually for an officer actually losing their certification in post uh, needed to be a high standard. Right now, the uh, potential amendments for the bill actually lower the standard quite significantly, and so I don't actually anticipate that CML will be standing up to support that bill specifically. And as noted, this bill will be considered, this, the recommendation from the policy committee will be considered by the CMO board on February 23rd, which is what uh, that column means. Um, Talk about this one briefly because it is a bill that's no longer alive. But uh, Diane, you want to mention quickly the uh, House Bill outcome of House Bill 1084? Yes, House 
House Bill 1084 would have expanded the potential uses of a county-wide lodging tax. So counties have statutory authority to collect an up to 2% uh, tax on lodging. As you can imagine, most of those activities happen in municipal areas. And counties may use it solely for advertising and marketing. Um, there was a proposal coming out of um, one of the counties to expand the use of that pursuant to voter approval for workforce housing and for a variety of reasons the county's um, proposal just allowed would have allowed counties to go to voters to seek the use of those revenues for any purpose. Most of the um, concern about the bill came from municip municipalities that had an interest in making sure that the small amount of revenue that was generated by the county tax was used to promote tourism and those tourist <clears throat> driven uh, sub economies of Colorado. Um, and it was the tourist um, boards themselves that um, uh, created enough concern that the bill sponsors um, quote unquote killed their own bill at the first hearing. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Megan has House Bill 1089. So House Bill 1089 has to do with uh, bail and bond reform. This bill uh, was discussed briefly in the interim committee around jail overcrowding, but was defeated. However, uh, Representative Benavides did bring it uh, as a bill under her name this year. Uh, it seems currently opposed to the bill. As introduced, the bill uh, removed monetary uh, bail and bond for misdemeanors, uh, municipal ordinance violations, and petty offenses, save for a few involving domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, we're opposed to this because we have some concerns on using uh, monetary bail and bond in order to have a backstop when someone fails to appear multiple times. Uh, to be fair to the sponsor, she has been very good about listening to our concerns, and there is a straight below amendment. However, I don't know that that amendment will get us to neutral. Uh, that bill is up tomorrow, and I do anticipate a municipal judge will be testifying in opposition on behalf of us. And for those that don't speak capital speak, a strike law amendment okay. is? Uh, there, it's it's, a, it's a, an amendment that removes the majority of the bill and replaces it with another. Strikes everything below the enacting yeah. clause and it's a whole new bill. That's correct. So That's, Well, in that case, this is not actually a strike law amendment. But no. well, it's, a, it's a significant amendment. Well, there you go. Um, House Bill 1092, um, also something that the policy committee considered uh, last week, and staff recommendation was neutral. Uh, this bill would allow municipalities at uh, their option to uh, permit, license and permit marijuana delivery within their jurisdiction and within up to two additional jurisdictions with those municipalities' permission. Uh, uh, a whole lot of issues were discussed with the potential of moving the secure uh, transaction out of the retail or medical marijuana center environment, putting it on someone's doorstep. Um, however, since this was an option, nothing that's mandated, the league doesn't feel like anyone's actually gonna opt into this. Uh, you know, we're just neutral on the bill. If, it, uh, if no one actually does this, the, the, and even if they do, the uh, pilot project sunsets in 2020 and it's repealed from statute. Uh, but I do expect, regardless of the outcome of this, Delivery will continue to be um, discussed uh, pretty regularly. Uh, let me move on to House Bill 1096. This is a real easy bill. This was CML initiated legislation. Uh, there was a language related to special event permits and uh, state uh, liquor enforcement rules and regulations that the division was proposing to delete language that allows uh, currently allows municipalities to uh, issue special event permits to themselves for festivals and uh, certain community events. Uh, the division didn't feel like there's uh, adequate statutory authority for the rule, even though in 2012 the rule was adopted, citing st adequate statutory authority. They were going to propose to remove it from the rules. We said, time out, let us run a bill, give it the statutory authority, and uh, 1096 just simply codifies the existing rule. Um, let's see, I think it's still me. 1099. Um, in the world of broadband, which I know is particularly uh, important to rural Colorado, we'll be talking about another one in a second, the Senate Bill 2. Um, House Bill 1099 uh, is a CCI, Colorado County's initiated bill that the league's supporting. 
uh, it would uh, deal with the existing right of first refusal that an incumbent uh, telecom provider has when another telecom provider gets a grant from the Broadband Deployment Board. Essentially, um, and it's usually CenturyLink in most cases, not always, uh, would be the incumbent provider. If um, XYZ Broadband Company gets a uh, grant and is going to provide a certain level of broadband service with that grant money, the uh, incumbent provider can step in and say, well, we'll provide it and, uh, and assume the uh, grant money, uh, but there is no requirement when they exercise the right of first refusal that they build the network at the speed that the that XYZ was going to do it, and they can charge more for it when they do. So this bill, which we support, would level the playing field by saying, if you're going to exercise your right of first refusal, you have to build something that is equivalent or faster, and uh, do so at the same cost or less expensive. It's going to be really interesting to hear the telecoms oppose that uh, and say why they should build something slower and more expensive. And that's House Bill 1099. Uh, I think we're on to House Bill 1128, which is Diane's. Thank you. 1128 is a proposal that came from the Colorado Attorney General to update the Consumer Protection Act by um, more specifically setting out the obligations for private entities upon a data breach. Um, this is following big data breaches like the Equifax data breach. Um, the bill basically didn't really apply to public entities as introduced. We were brought into the bill in a surprise last minute amendment. Um, <clears throat> we still are gathering feedback on the strike below amendment. Please feel free to take a look at that. I've sent it out to folks for review. I think most of the feedback that I'm getting is we all understand that we need that we have in the past and will have an obligation in the future to maintain um, personal income, uh, personal information, um, holding that um, to the highest standard of protection. And I think the devil is in the details on this one. If you have an IT department that you can solicit impact, input from, that would be very useful because I think this bill has legs and is likely to go through the legislature. Megan has House Bill 1131. Thank you. So this is a municipal court issue. What this bill does, this also came out of the uh, interim committee that had to do with jail overcrowding and court costs. Uh, this bill creates a program at the state level to uh, create an opportunity for remote participation in hearings. So this is the use of technology, video advisals, uh, telephonic advisals, things of that nature. Uh, and we actually worked with a sponsor to get an amendment to allow local opt-in to that program and allow a municipality to opt in to try to hold more. The intent is to hold hearings quicker. Uh, and then if a prisoner is taken or if someone is in custody, you know, say on the West Slope and they're actually held on a charge outside of, say, Aurora, that they can hold the, that uh, video advisal as quickly as possible and get individuals uh, released from custody. Okay. And then continuing with Megan, House Bill 11. House Bill 1184 is the next generation 911 board. It's the creation of a next generation 911 board. This came as a recommendation from a subcommittee that was convened by the governor's office in the interim. Uh, it creates the board. The, the, the purpose is to lead the planning for and the implementation um, of sustainable next generation 911. Uh, we believe as a whole this is a positive step and CML staff actually got a position for the for a municipal official um, or CML staff to serve on the next generation 911 board. We have heard some concerns from um, 911 authorities throughout the state and so we are listening to those concerns. That's why um, I'm still kind of collecting more information and the policy committee uh, is, has recommended, um, which we will recommend to the board, a staff discretion position. Uh, next is 1190. 1190 is the continuation of the Historic Preservation Tax Credit, which was established in 2014. Uh, we did uh, support the initial program or the creation of the program and uh, support its extension. This one uh, continues the credit at 10 million annually uh, with a split up between a 50 50 between large projects and small projects and a focus on rural communities as well. Okay. I will go next. House Bill 1201. 
Um, I'll try and do this quickly. Uh, I think folks, particularly in energy impacted communities, are aware of the importance of severance tax, particularly through the Energy Mineral Impact Grant Program and then direct distribution dollars. I'm probably also aware that from 2008 to 2013, nearly $400 million of that money that would have otherwise gone to local governments uh, was siphoned into the state general fund in order to prevent other cuts. And actually in 2015, when uh, everything was doing much, much better, uh, local government severance tax and the portion that goes to the state as well, uh, some of that was siphoned into the general fund to uh, uh, help fund Tabor refunds that year. Uh, the concern of the league is that, uh, particularly now at the hospital provider fee, last year's Senate Bill 267 is an enterprise program and can no longer, uh, there's no need for it to be adjusted by the General Assembly because it doesn't count against the state's Tabor revenue limit. That leaves a big bullseye on severance tax and when, and they will, uh, severance tax revenues eventually recover. We start having them come back in if the state exceeds its Tabor cap. We're concerned that, that, that the state will go to where it likes to go and uh, try to capture the severance tax money. House Bill 1201 would refer a question to voters to say that in the event that the state uh, is projected to exceed its Tabor revenue cap, that uh, the severance tax revenues are dispersed, that they will not count against the cap. And the penalty uh, that the General Assembly can still transfer, but the debursing would go away. It would also go away if the tax or credit structure changes. I know that uh, those that may uh, be in support of a change to the ad valorem tax credit structure, or perhaps an increase in the tax rate, may have concerns about um, that prohibition against uh, the debrucing status going away if we have a tax or credit change. But in all honesty, that is not a concern because anyone that submits that question, whether through initiative or referred measure, would, would propose to debruce it anyway. This is. Uh, not just a statement bill, um, you know, there's not a lot of severance tax revenue right now. This actually does matter if the severance tax revenues had been debruced, they would not have been uh, taken in 2015. Uh, and there wouldn't have been any need to. Uh, so it's more than just a statement bill, this actually means something. And it'll be interesting to see how this uh, discussion takes place. You'll know that the bill is not scheduled until Monday, April 9th. Um, happy birthday to me. Um, but uh, that is uh, to allow some time to uh, flesh out some of the issues and particularly to see how the uh, next economic forecast, which is due at the end of March, uh, shows severance tax revenue. So that's House Bill 1201. I believe that exhausts all of the House. No, I'm sorry, one more. House Bill 1234, sorry. One more, no problem. Uh, so back in 2015, CML supported a bill um, that ultimately passed that uh, outlawed or uh, made illegal, rendered illegal internet suites, stakes, cafes um, that are operating in municipalities outside what is the constitutionally approved uh, three cities, Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek. Uh, though that legislation did pass in 2015, there are still, uh, these businesses are still popping up in municipality and uh, in municipalities, excuse me, and there are some, there is a, a court question currently as to the vagueness of the current statute. So House Bill one, uh, 1234 is actually further clarifying that internet sweepstakes cafes is considered gambling in Colorado and should only uh, take place in the three constitutionally uh, required cities. Additionally, the funds that are being earned through uh, these sweepstakes cafes, because they're not in the gambling towns, are not going to um, historic preservation dollars or limited gaming impact funds as well. Uh, and we believe that they are going to operate that that needs to happen. So that is why we're going to support this legislation. And one feature I forgot to point out, and I can do it on this bill, you'll note that the bill numbers are all hyperlinked. And if you click on that, it'll open up another window. And if you have insomnia or uh, mm -hmm. uh, any other related condition, you can actually read the latest version of the bill, which in this case is the introduced version. So. Uh, Another little feature that's available. Uh, I'm going to close that out, back up to the uh, to our legislative session page, and open up the Senate calendar. And uh, starting us off there will be Morgan with Senate Bill One, Transportation Infrastructure Funding. <laughs> 
And this is a bill that we're taking a neutral position on, but it's one uh, worth paying attention to because uh, infrastructure, state infrastructure funding uh, is, has been one of the biggest issues uh, uh, that's been in front of the Colorado State Legislature in recent years. Uh, what the bill does is it would uh, require 10% of existing state sales tax uh, to go toward a uh, dedicated, uh, as a dedicated revenue source uh, for state infrastructure funding. Uh, it would repeal certain provisions in Senate Bill 267 that was passed last year. Uh, specific, specifically, it would remove the lend purchase agreements uh, of that bill um, that uh, provided uh, $1.8 billion in uh, COPs that went towards state infrastructure. And in its place, it would ask voters uh, in November for a $3 billion bond. What the bill doesn't do is provide a statewide solution to uh, uh, to Colorado's infrastructure challenges, and it doesn't have any and provide or provide any uh, local share back provisions to help municipalities or local governments across the state deal with their infrastructure challenges, and that's why we're a neutral uh, taking a neutral position on the bill. Related to transportation funding, we expect to see uh, in the next couple of days uh, the Denver Metro Chamber and the contractors' uh, uh, ballot initiatives that uh, will look a whole lot like House Bill 1242 from last year. Um, various sales tax rates, and uh, uh, they will start their way through the initiative process, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, moving on to Senate Bill 2, while I mentioned we go back to talking about broadband, this is uh, legislation to uh, repurpose the high-cost support mechanism. Everyone pays a, a buck fifty or something like that on your phone bill. That uh, revenue, uh, that, that goes to subsidize uh, these incumbent providers for providing landline services, um, which pretty much everyone has everywhere. Um, and, and so that is just uh, subsidy money that, uh, that mainly CenturyLink, but other smaller telecoms are able to, to hang on to. Senate Bill 2 says that uh, we have greater needs in broadband infrastructure and proposes repurposing that money and uh, starting with $60 million a year and uh, increasing over the next five years to 100% of the high cost support mechanism to the broadband deployment board for broadband grants. That's the good news. The bad news is, is um, when the uh, uh, bill in the Senate, the, uh, the, the sharks were circling in chunked water and got uh, amendments on the bill that uh, will, yes, uh, still allow broadband grants to be uh, issued to providers, but uh, would allow them to apply for and receive grant dollars to do so, providing networks at speeds um, reminiscent of the average speed in 2011, 10 megabytes down, one megabyte up. Um, for those of you that uh, have something less than that, that might sound good, but the uh, intent is to try and build networks of tomorrow, not yesterday. And uh, so I have staff discretion from the board on the bill. We're currently neutral. Um, and when the bill is heard in uh, the House Ag Committee, on uh, Monday, March 5th, uh, we'll be testifying. Usually don't testify on neutral bills, but we'll be testifying on all the reasons why we can't support the bill. Uh, specifically, the amendment that was added in the Senate that untethers the, the uh, minimum speeds from the Federal uh, Communications uh, Commission, FCC's definition of minimum speed of 25 down, three up. Uh, we want to see that reestablished so that any broadband grants that are issued uh, could only be for networks that are going to be building that, which is less than the average speed in 2014, but still um, a lot faster than uh, most rural Colorado is, is able to get now. Um, it would be very, uh, very contentious, I expect. Um, and we've had a lot of discussion with our partners, um, uh, particularly with the counties, on how to approach the bill and make sure that, uh, uh, that the money still flows, at least that's the league's priority to make sure that the money still transfers um, even if uh, some of these other things aren't done uh, ideally we'd like to get the bill amended so it actually does all of the things that the proponents um, say that they intend to do so that's senate bill two that one's still got a ways to go through the process uh, morgan has senate bill three so Senate Bill 3 is the uh, reauthorization of the Colorado Energy Office. Uh, you guys uh, may recall uh, Senate Bill 301 that was introduced. Uh, it was a Senator Ray Scott uh, bill that was introduced at the uh, last week of the 2017 legislative session that I kind of call the 
ener energy omnibus bill because it had a lot of different uh, provisions in it. One of the components of that was the reauthorization of the Colorado Energy Office. That bail bill failed to resolve differences between the House and Senate and ultimately died. And uh, since last July, the Colorado Energy Office has only been operating on some federal, federal funding that they are currently receiving. Uh, this bill would reauthorize the Colorado Energy Office and also uh, restore funding uh, to that. And uh, our policy committee is elected to support the bill and, um, and uh, also the $1.5 million uh, in general fund money that goes to, um, to uh, keeping the office open. Or you continue with Senate Bill Five. Uh, Senate Bill Five. Right now, we have a we're neutral on it, but um, that deserves an explanation. Uh, we this is a bill that has uh, been introduced. This is the fourth session that we've seen a bill like this. Uh, what it does is uh, it would direct the director of the Department of Local Affairs to work with. Uh, uh, state agencies to provide support uh, to local governments that have been um, hit by some sort of an economic calamity, um, you know, a mine closure, a, a major hospital uh, closure. Uh, rural towns, you know, where you've got a, a large number of their workforce, um, you know, that operate under a single employer uh, could be hard hit. This would help to provide uh, services um, and resources um, to help them uh, in that effort. Uh, when the bill was up in uh, the Senate State Affairs Committee, uh, it uh, was it stripped um, the half a million dollars that it was going to receive every year for the next three years um, to help provide services for those rural communities. So now uh, the bill really doesn't do anything that the Department of Local Affairs isn't already doing uh, now that the, the funding uh, has been stripped out of it. Uh, and so we have removed our support for the bill and have taken a neutral position unless that funding is restored. Okay, and Morgan will continue with Senate Bill 19. Uh, so this uh, bill has to do with the expanded duration of the uh, of loans that are issued by the Colorado Water uh, Resources and Power Development Authority. Um, the uh, the CWR uh, PDA has the authority to issue loans uh, through the Federal Clean Water Act and the Safe Water Drinking Act. Uh, the feds have expanded uh, their loan terms. Uh, it used to be 20 years, uh, now it's 30 years. This bill uh, would uh, amend state law um, so that is consistent with federal law. Uh, you know, right now under state law it's 20 years. This would expand it to 30 years. The added benefit, though, is that municipalities uh, that um, need to uh, improve their water infrastructure would have more convenient loan terms. Uh, uh, and more flexible loan terms under this new bill um, that you know could help some of these smaller communities um, afford some uh, some of these loans that they might not otherwise be able to do. And we are supporting the bill. Uh, I, just a, a quick add: the bill has already cleared the legislature um, and is uh, sent has been sent to the governor's desk. Megan, Senate Bill Twenty Four. Thank you. This Senate Bill 24 is another bill that came out of the Interim Committee on Opioids and Substance Abuse. Uh, CML is supporting this bill as uh, an opportunity to get more behavioral health care providers in rural areas. What the legislation does is add behavioral health care providers to the list of uh, providers that are eligible for loan repayment, uh, existing list being doctors and nurses. Uh, folks of that nature. It also creates a scholarship program to cover the cost of certification, as well as medication assisted treatment training, uh, which is also uh, very much needed in rural areas on this issue. And continuing on with Megan, Senate Bill 66. Senate Bill 66 is the reauthorization of the Division of Lottery. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Uh, this bill, uh, as introduced, the bill uh, reauthorized the lottery in perpetuity. Uh, in the Senate Finance Committee, there was an amendment to reauthorize it for 25 years and then sunset it then, uh, which was, uh, for the proponents, uh, perfectly fine. Uh, that bill has passed uh, the Senate in, on second reading, and we look uh, looks like it should have a fairly easy time getting through the House. And then Senate Bill 67 is uh, legislation that the League assisted uh, in, in drafting, um, mainly because of the interest that we have in local liquor licensing and making sure it's done properly. Uh, uh, 
uh, bottom line is nonprofit associations and others that held um, fundraising events um, were unable to auction, uh, usually like wine baskets, but alcohol in sealed containers um, on, on the wherever they were doing it. In particular, on uh, like an event center that has its own liquor license, it was it's a violation of their liquor license to allow sale or donation of uh, alcohol uh, in sealed containers. So all, all this bill simply does is create an exception. It's hard to write in our liquor code, I've got to be honest with you, but it creates a very a simple exception that says if you're having an auction uh, and a liquor store donates something for, for the auction, that you can actually auction it off on, uh, on the premises and give it to the winner. Otherwise, those transactions were occurring out in the parking lot, which was kind of silly. Uh, that's Senate Bill 67, and uh, that has already passed the House and will be, it's not already there on the, on the governor's desk. I skipped one uh, uh, unintentionally, and I apologize about that, but there's good news. It's probably not updated yet. No, it's not. Morgan, uh, would you quickly talk about the demise of uh, Senate Bill 45? Uh, yeah, this is the repeal of the Architectural uh, Paint Stewardship Act. What this bill does is it uh, puts a surcharge on uh, paint. So it's uh, 70 cents for a gallon of paint um, that a consumer pays, and that money goes to fund paint care, uh, which provides uh, drop-off locations that will treat this um, as hazardous waste uh, so the, uh, so paint, wet paint doesn't wind up in our landfills and contain cause any groundwater contamination. It also helps to support uh, paint recycling efforts across the state. Uh, we care about this bill because um, if the, if the uh, paint care program goes away, then it's up to municipalities um, to have to uh, create their own uh, hazardous waste programs to deal with paint. So um, the bill uh, actually uh, died on the Senate floor um, uh, this morning, uh, and it has been uh, Postponed in Nepal. I'll be updating that soon. Uh, moving on to Diane. Um, Senate Bill 107. Thanks, Kevin. Um, this is a very simple bill. It does uh, some updates to Title 31 elections. <clears throat> Just gets rid of a basically never used um, uh, nomination committee process on petitions. So if you pull out of a petition, um, you will, anyway, um, I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but it's kind of a technical bill and it came up by request of the Clerks Association. Getting rid of something that no one uses anymore. Senate Bill 139, Diane. 139 is up this afternoon. This is a bill that has some good aspects. Unfortunately, they come at the cost of the loss of local control. So the bill, um, <clears throat> create state licensure for um, retailers of uh, tobacco products. Under current law, um, if a local government imposes um, taxes, fees, or registration for cigarettes, they can't get their uh, cigarette tax share back. Um, what the bill does is it changes current law by putting in a very sweeping um, preemption clause in the legislative intent section, and those go uh, along like this. This is a matter of statewide concern. That's what um, preemption is, and it signals to us here at the League and everybody out in municipal land that uh, the state is intending on kind of occupying the field, taking control of a certain area. How the bill does that is it says if any local government um, regulates other tobacco products, those are snuff and blah, 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 um, and as well as nicotine products, so those are the vaping things that I know a lot of communities are having increasing concerns about underage smoking. If they do anything to regulate those, have any fees like business license fees or taxes, although I'm not aware of anybody that is taxing those separately, um, that they will likewise not get their share back. Um, then it, the bill does some other stuff on the granting side. Um, the state licensure uh, kind of enforcement activities would be uh, funded through um, the same fund that funds tobacco cessation and education. And for that reason, 
several uh, kind of of the health associations like the American Heart Association oppose the bill, and I will be testifying in opposition to the bill this afternoon. Okay, and the last Senate bill that we'll cover is Senate Bill 167, Morgan. Uh, so, uh, Senate Bill 167 um, is a uh, bill that would uh, fundamentally transform Colorado's 811 uh, Call Before You Dig program. Uh, the bill essentially does two different things. The first, it would require uh, tier one membership of all 811 uh, facility owners uh, across the state. Um, uh, so what that means is uh, as a tier one member, you would receive direct notification from 811 um, uh, and then you would go out and uh, facilitate a locate uh, for the excavator. The other thing that the bill does is creates a 12 member safety commission um, that would have uh, broad oversight uh, and enforcement of 811 uh, provisions. Uh, we've uh, had a couple of initial concerns um, regarding the bill. Um, right now we have up there, it's uh, our position is staff discretion. Um, first was the constitution, constitutionality of the bill um, of you know a, a state uh, designated commission having oversight of municipalities and municipal infrastructure. Uh, and then the other was uh, liability concerns uh, re regarding uh, locates uh, for privately owned infrastructure that would be required under this bill. Um, the third concern uh, that we haven't fully addressed yet and we're still working on is the cost um, that it's going to, uh, the cost that's, that is going to uh, be incurred by current municipalities and municipal utilities that are tier two members uh, that have to transition over to tier one. We've gotten uh, heard from a number of municipalities that have real cost concerns and we're trying to deal with those issues right now. All right, so that bill has its first hearing tomorrow and uh, see where we're at after that. Um, if you have some questions about any of the things we covered or stuff that we didn't cover, you probably saw I scroll by a bunch of bills there too that um, we're neutral on or are dead or whatever. Um, now it's time to start uh, uh, asking those questions. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to just hit a couple of issues that we know are coming up. Um, that uh, we anticipate legislation, but there's not yet been legislation yet. Um, I'm going to ask Megan to go first and just talk quickly about uh, uh, municipal courts and uh, and then also law enforcement internal affair records. Yeah, so the first thing I want to talk about having to do with municipal courts is a bill that um, probably a lot of you will be shocked to hear was brought to us by the ACLU. Um, what the ACLU, uh, the intent behind their idea that they initially brought to us was to um, mandate that munis municipalities create an independent entity or appoint an independent entity that did the hiring and firing of municipal public defenders. Um, we had a lot of pushback in terms of hiring authority as well as firing authority um, through uh, particularly from the municipal judges, but as well as some of uh, city managers and, and elected officials. Um, what we, after several months of working on this, uh, what we have negotiated is a bill that will allow um, municipalities uh, the ability to actually contract with the Alternative Defense Council that's created through the state for public defense. Um, we can also, so that's one option. There is also another option for municipalities to utilize ADC uh, as their conflict council as well, which is not something that we had before. So that is a big part of that bill and a success, I would add. The second option that a municipality can do is um, contract their own public defender and continue to do what they're doing and then uh, work with ADC to evaluate that public defender once every couple of years. And finally, if the municipality so desires, they can either on their own or in partnership, uh, in a regional partnership, create an independent council or independent commission to oversee the public defender, um, similar to what is already happening in Denver and Aurora. Um, I took this to the policy committee with a neutral position as we have negotiated the bill pretty heavily. Uh, they did approve that and I will be asking the board to ratify that position as well this week. Um, but if you have any questions or feedback, please uh, give me a call. Uh, the second one has to do with uh, the release of law enforcement internal affairs records. There's a potential bill to require the release of IA records um, for officer misconduct while on duty. 
Uh, we're, we're part of a stakeholder process right now. We don't have an official bill draft yet, um, but we do have some concerns right now about the further chilling effect on hiring and additional time on um, information requests if this bill does go into effect. And then I'm just going to mention quickly uh, two things. One, I know is going to be an introduced bill dealing with marijuana on-premise consumption. Uh, and uh, the gist of the bill is, is that uh, in municipalities that already allow uh, retail uh, and or medical marijuana, they would further have the option to allow licensees, retail or medical licensees to operate uh, accessory consumption premises. What does that mean? Uh, a separately, a separate facility, a separate place in which people can go into and uh, socially consume. Uh, they would be able to purchase small quantities uh, and uh, have to consume on site. No smoking, vaping or edibles only. Otherwise they have to change the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act. And municipalities can be more stringent if they decided to be uh, on pretty much everything. Um, there's still a little work uh, in the last draft I saw. We currently have an opposed and less amended position based on, the pre based on a previous draft. Um, but the conversation we've had with the board and the policy committee was that um, uh, it's not an if but when that an on-premise consumption bill will pass. Um, the proponents of this bill have expressed an interest in basically dealing with every issue of local control and uh, opt-in that we have raised. Uh, our decision has been to work with them and hopefully be neutral on the bill and then leave it up to our members to decide whether or not they want to participate. Obviously with municipalities, because it's a constitutional right, uh, this could also be an opt-in by initiative uh, or a referendum as well. Last, uh, a lot of discussion about beer and liquor, the January 1st, 2019 transition, any fermented malt beverage or 3-2 license holder um, can begin selling full strength beer, malt liquor, anything that qualifies as malt liquor. That will happen barring any change in the law. We've advocated for some modest changes like the ability to have a 500 foot distance restriction from schools for new licenses, be able to waive or reduce those distance restrictions. But uh, what's really going on is the retail liquor stores, grocery stores, uh, convenience stores, along with uh, craft brewers, distributors, and uh, distilled spirits folks. Um, they're about to have World War III again at the State House trying to amend parts of what was passed two years ago in Senate Bill 197. Uh, no bill has been introduced yet. There's a draft. I don't know if there will be a bill, uh, but we intend to pursue the very easy, by comparison, municipal issues either within this bill or separately if necessary. Um, that exhausts the list of topics, uh, and um, I wanted to point out one more thing uh, and give folks time if there are any questions I think you want to ask about to make sure you type those into the question window. Um, uh, one last feature that uh, uh, I didn't point out, uh, and we're starting to utilize this a little bit more, is a legislative blog that covers some of the key issues that uh, are coming up in the state house. Uh, because it's a blog, we can write it a little bit differently than we do a standard um, a standard update. Um, you can find that either by going to the legislative page and clicking on uh, and, and clicking on the legislative matters blog. It's also under uh, the resources tab and blog. So while that's loading, um, uh, and it's taking a second. I know that uh, Lisa has a couple announcements, then we'll check back and see if there's any questions. Lisa? Great, thank you. So type in those questions. Um, certainly want to hear from you if there's anything on your mind that we didn't cover or could go more into depth on. Um, you know, this webinar is just an example of what we do to ensure that you are current and up to date on the information that's important to you. So if you have any feedback on the webinar itself, let us know that as well. We're certainly open to that. Uh, speaking of keeping you updated, March 21st, CML will be hosting an all-day workshop. Uh, it's our effective governance workshop. It is for elected officials. So if you're a newly elected official or if you have colleagues in your city or town that are, or perhaps folks who just want a little refresher, that is going to be a day-long workshop filled with some great information for elected officials. I encourage you to go to our website uh, to check that out. Go under events. And then finally, our annual conference is open. Registration is open June 19th through 22nd in Vail this year. 
we hope to see you there. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Kevin for answering any questions. So um, just real quick to close out the blog stuff. So you can go uh, through the legislative page from the home page. You can go to resources and blogs. You can also see Sam Mammoth's Municipalities Matter, Matters blog on there. Uh, but scroll down. This is a, a most recent one. We talked talk about broadband. This relates to Senate Bill 2. Uh, my colleagues uh, also will be contributing that. If you don't want to go through the CML website, you can also go to Legislative Matters, all one word, legislativematters.wordpress.com. Uh, so that is our Legislative Matters blog. Very exciting. Uh, got a comment. Uh, thanks, Bonnie Finley. I uh, love the format and the information. Well, glad you enjoy it. We'll be doing another one of these on April 18th, I believe. Uh, so check the CML events calendar. Um, uh, I believe it's April 18th. Uh, and uh, we'll have probably some new stuff to talk about at that point in time. Uh, we have a few moments left. Are there any other, are there any questions or anything that uh, anyone would like to ask about uh, on any legislative issue that we covered or did not cover, something you're interested in? Give just a couple minutes to see if there's anything that pops up there. And Lisa tells me that April 18th is correct. I get a gold star for guessing. So if you want to uh, check in on this uh, same webinar again, uh, see what a couple of months brings us, then uh, April 18th also at noon. And I think that registration link is already open on, on, our, uh, on our website. If not, it will be soon. I don't see any additional questions, so with uh, two minutes left in the lunch hour. I guess we'll wind this down. Thanks for participating. Also, you know you can contact us at any time. Uh, and on the legislative page, uh, you can uh, let me get back to it. Well, you can open up the, the page that has the lobbyists, uh, and, uh, but it's easy. It's our first initial last name at cml.org uh, for any one of us. If you're not sure, just email me or call me, and I'll get you routed to the right person. Uh, my email is kbomber at cml.org, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, helping you out any way we can. Hopefully, uh, the rest of the legislative session is all good things, but if not, make sure you uh, subscribe to the CML Statehouse Report. If you don't already, pay attention to that, and we'll keep you posted on everything going on. Thanks a lot for participating. Have a nice afternoon.